perhaps these women are making these claims in the hope of receiving some sort of monetary compensation. So today we're here to discuss uh, the uh, scandal that uh, came out recently about one of the most famous comedians in Japan, Matsumoto, who was accused by anonymously by two women of sexual assault. Now, the sexual assault apparently happened eight years ago in a hotel room, in a very high-end hotel room in Rapongi, where these girls were invited by Matsumoto and two other of his friends. So we know that the girls were asked to leave their phones outside or, or not bring it uh, inside uh, the hotel room. We know they played some sort of a sexual games, uh, but we also know that um, Matsumoto has uh, uh, made public uh, some uh, uh, messages that he exchanged uh, uh, with the uh, accusers that, that were basically thanking him for the night. Now these women after eight years uh, come up say they were assaulted. I mean, we've seen this happening all over the world. I mean, uh, we've seen this in Hollywood. We've seen that recently with the other British comedian. We've seen this again with the um, other famous uh, uh, agency in, in Japan. My question is, where does the assault begin and where does the uh, complacency uh, towards somebody who's uh, maybe from whom you're expecting something back begin. So Well, I, this raises a lot of very interesting and difficult questions. And as you say, these are questions that are happening worldwide. This isn't necessarily a Japan-specific phenomena. But where it becomes unusual is that there seems to be in Japan no ability to withdraw consent. Once you've consented, even if you change your mind and you're not comfortable with what's happening, it's very difficult to say, no, stop, I changed my mind. And, and this becomes a problem. So there have been a number of, of instances of rape in Japan where, yes, the, the man had an expectation. Maybe he bought dinner or whatever it was. He felt he had a right to a sexual favor. And perhaps the woman was willing until she realized, wait a minute, this is, this is more than I bargained for. And it, and it becomes difficult to say no. But I think, you know, the world standard these days for these things is that either party should at any point be able to withdraw consent and say, no, I don't want this anymore. Obviously, once the act is completed, to say, no, I don't want this anymore becomes a logistical problem. But setting that aside, um, you know, in this kind of a scenario where the women's phones were taken away from them, so the men obviously did not want any form of record or any ability for whatever they were doing in that private hotel room to be made public, you do have to wonder what was their agenda. The fact that the women waited a period of time doesn't necessarily bother me, although if they waited eight years, I suspect that they are beyond the legal statute of limitations for actually bringing a criminal claim. Uh, and, and maybe they're making this public in the hope of, of getting some sort of a civil monetary claim. I don't know. I can well understand if someone has been sexually assaulted where they tried to withdraw consent and matters continued against the will of one party that they might suffer some sort of an emotional trauma that could take years to manifest. We do have issues yet in Japan with men not understanding that there are boundaries and that women should have the right to decide what happens to their own bodies. We still have problems on in Japan with men feeling that they have a right to grope a woman on a train. You know, it's a crowded train, she's cute, I guess I'll just grab her ass. Uh, and unfortunately, Japan's response is not to teach the men how to behave better, it's to isolate the women by giving them women, women's only train cards. A number of my Japanese friends, particularly uh, particu the, the ones who are diminutive, they're very, the very petite women, uh, have told me that when they were high school girls wearing school uniforms on trains, it was a very common occurrence. We're talking about young women. Uh, to some extent, we had in Japan some pretty substantial, I would say, uh, cultural influence from uh, from United States, from the West. Uh, women's rights. Uh, you now you can hear and read everywhere about uh, 
uh, empowering women. And what am I? What I'm well, asking is, what? Why do you think still today, a woman in Japan, especially when confronted with uh, with a man who who's, uh, has has a much higher position, who's much older, has a difficulty of saying no? I think your your question assumes that the woman has difficulty saying no. Uh, and, and, and I suspect that the problem isn't that the woman has difficulty saying no, so much as it is that the man has difficulty hearing no. Mm -hmm. So it may very well be that the woman is saying no, but the man is not getting the message. Women in, in Japan are still raised to be polite. And so they might not flat out say, I don't like this. And, and they might be saying it in different ways and it's hard to hear the no message. We're, we're getting to the point where women are learning to be more assertive in Japan, but it's a difficult culture even for men to be assertive. It's all that much more difficult for women to be assertive. Let, let's talk about the elephant in the room here. So where are these women just looking for something back, some, uh, some sort of uh, an appearance on a TV show? Uh, a, a part of a, on a on a on a movie. You're assuming that we don't know, and, and yes, it could very well be that very young women. You know, it's a, it's a bit like uh, you, you know you heard about in the in the United States in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, the casting couch. Yeah. You know, you had to put out to get the role, uh, and and it could very well be that these women are assuming that they have to do something in order to get ahead in their career career aspirations as a starlet or whatever. But we don't know. Were the women hoping that by being cooperative with these men, that would trigger their careers? We have no idea. But we've seen this uh, same we dynamic plays out, for, for example, with the Winston cases in Hollywood. We know what happened. We know for a fact that women went there. Sorry. They were willing to make an enormous personal sacrifice for the sake of that. It, and, and that could have been what's going on. But that's a bit of a of a of a of a cynical approach. I mean, it could also be that these young women, you know, again, very young, probably not a whole lot of judgment, were more starstruck. Sometimes there is this, well, gee, if the guy's going to take me out and buy me a nice meal and show me a good time, well, okay, fine, I'll spend time with him. Mm -hmm. But that's all they're expecting. You know, it's nothing more. Maybe it's just the free meal or the, the chance to rub shoulders with the famous man to have a story to tell later. We don't know. Right, we, right. We so agree. to me, it makes me think, it makes me think only one thing because uh, from the accuser perspective, uh, uh, you know that it's almost impossible to prove you being raped, uh, not just because you have no proof, solid proof. What usually happens uh, is that these cases go on- uh, A settlement? Yes, right. Some so form they, of compensation. Right, exactly. Settlement. Do, that, does that make that you think that that would well be the only the only probable like uh, outcome of, of, of cases like this? Because there's no way either part can can hundred uh, percent prove. If we look at it, then take the criminal piece off the table, and we look strictly at the civil piece. Then perhaps these women are making this claim in the hope of receiving some sort of monetary compensation for the damage that has been inflicted on them. And again, why wait eight years? Hmm. Sometimes an emotional trauma can be cumulative. 